that a thousand years ago, they weren't just a fringe group at the outskirts of history. Their threat to Masera was very real, and in some cities they became a majority. It caused all sorts of ripples, not only religiously but socially. And we have a large amount of documentation because Karaites and Rabbinites, that's how Orthodox Jews were known, intermarried. They were in business together in ways that would be unheard of in parallel situations nowadays. And he decreed that, firstly, they would be responsible for the full tax demanded by the mayor, and he cursed them that they would never have a tenth man to make a minion. Now, certain elements of that story are undoubtedly correct. And therefore, it is now that we come across the custom to read in shul on Friday night the second chapter of the Mishnayos of Shabbos, i.e. Bamer Madlikin. What do you light with and what do you not light with Shabbos candles? To highlight that it's permissible to light candles. Welcome to History for the Curious. I'm Mena Reisner, and I host the internationally renowned lecturer, dynamic historian and tour guide, Rabbi Aubrey Hirsch. Experience our history, confront dilemmas, and reveal the untold stories of 3,000 years of Jewish heritage, from Paris to Cairo, from the Russian Tsar to Maimonides, and from the Sinai Revelation to the French Revolution. Join the fastest growing Jewish history podcast in the world by subscribing to this channel and discovering the events that have shaped us into who we are today. Robert Hirsch, welcome back. We're back with a brand new series, and I just want to remind the listeners before we start that our trip to Vienna still has a few spaces left. It's taking place on the 6th till the 9th of May with Rabbi Hirsch and Rabbi Tetz. And there's an email address which I'll leave in the description below that you can bag your place still. Rabbi Hirsch, what's our new series about? Okay, so today we are going to introduce a group of people who are vaguely known to Jewish history, but people are unaware of the extent of involvement that they had in Jewish life. Meaning when we consider non-Orthodox movements in the last 250 years, we think of reform, which came to do, as the title suggests, reform. So they were going to alter or abrogate or reject, all of which they did. Uh, but today we're going to talk about a much older movement, the Karaites, Kroim. And their essential changes were from within. It caused all sorts of ripples, not only religiously but socially. And we have a large amount of documentation because Karaites and Rabbinites, that's how Orthodox Jews were known, intermarried. They were in business together in ways that would be unheard of in parallel situations nowadays. So who or exactly were they? The Karaites who called themselves Bale Mikra, the followers of the text. And they formed as a breakaway group from Orthodox Judaism, but well over a thousand years ago. And there are still some around today in small numbers. And we'll get to that in the final and third part of our series on the Karaites. Now, they recognized only Tanakh, meaning they denied the oral law, the rulings of the Gemara of Chazal, and many of their interpretations of the text that they do accept, and therefore of the mitzvahs, are quite literal, as we'll see. But they created an entire set of laws and uh, requirements in writing, and they accept the narratives such as Yitzhak Mitzrayim. It's a very unusual hybrid and there are certain things in which they ended up being more stringent than the Orthodox, except their practices don't conform with halacha. Practices, but the actual beliefs were different? Yes, because they do believe that God is the creator of all, and he is echad, that the what they call the law of Moses alone is true, 
they, for instance, they believe in Shabbos and they don't eat pork. And, you know, there, there are many markers which you would normally associate with an orthodox lifestyle. But their laws are carried out often in ways which are invalid. For instance, they don't wear tefillin. They believe it's simply conceptual. And what is important to bear in mind is that a thousand years ago, they weren't just a fringe group at the outskirts of history, their threat to Masera was very real. And in some cities, they became a majority. And it required the efforts of leading Goinim and Roshonim to combat their views and prove the emptiness of the arguments. So you have, for instance, Rav Sadyagon in the well, I guess, early 10th century, who stepped into the fray and authored a number of sorim in Arabic to expose these Karite ideas and encounter their heresies. And Rapsad Yugon is really the first author of philosophy as a result, which halted the inroads being made by these Karites. And Rapsad Yugon is quoted extensively, both by his Talmidim and by his detractors, by his enemies, um, although most of his writings have been lost. And it is thanks to his forceful intellect, which averted the imminent danger, and he became the object of attack uh, from all the leading Karite writers, even in later periods, although uh, it has to be said, they often replied with abuse rather than logic. And he was the, the, the defender of orthodoxy. So how did they start out? I mean, we know Reform have a leader and a founder. Did they have a founder? Was it a group of people? And, and where did they start? So the where is easier, um, roughly in Iraq. Uh, the when and the why is a little less clear. There are varied accounts which definitely talk of the Goenic period. The earliest date given is sometime during the 8th century. And um, listeners may be familiar with an account in Sefer HaKabbalah, which is not a book of Kabbalah, it's a book of history. Um, and this describes a nun, Ben David, who sort of aspired to become the Reish Gilusa, the lay leader of the Jewish people in Bovel, um, a position that was recognized by the government. And even though apparently he was learned and in fact uh, potentially a pupil of Mario Doi Gon of Sura, the sages were suspicious of his beliefs or of his conduct and passed over him in favor of his younger brother Hananya and he got very angry and therefore he established his own movement but the government arrested him the Muslim government on charges of subversion and sentenced him to death while he is in jail the story tells us he met another prisoner this time a Muslim sage who advised him, who gave him a way out to claim that he was actually establishing an entirely new religion. And a nun manages to bribe his way into an audience with the caliph. And by pointing out the similarities between his ideas or practices and those of the Muslims, he succeeded in winning the ruler's grace. It didn't happen, did it? Why would you say a thing like that? So, listen, it's cute, but... In part, at, for sure, it's unlikely, possibly in whole, uh, because we come across a dispute between David and Daniel, the latter being a grandson of this Anun, Anun the first, um, in fact, the father of Anun the second. And many of this uh, guy Daniel's supporters were located within the yeshivas of Bovel, which is hardly likely if his grandfather had founded a heretical sect maybe uh, 70 or 80 years earlier. And we also find in the records of Arab chroniclers that up to around the year 850, the house of Anun, as it's referred to, was part of Rabbinite Judaism, and that they only broke away during the time of Anun II. Which is why scholars today, they don't completely disregard Anun I, uh, but they refer to the 8th and 9th century and their, the followers as Ananites, but not Karites. And it definitely gave an impetus to the Karite movement, but they were less 
I guess you could say, defined, less structured in their actions, in their Judaism, they were still in the process of inventing it. And why is this all happening now? Well, I mean, religions and I guess challenges to religion don't develop in a vacuum. There are two things that are happening within the Muslim empire in the 8th century. Firstly, internally, it's a time of upheaval for the Muslims, which eventually led to the downfall of the Umayyad dynasty and the replacement by the Abbasids. And that obviously creates a time of change. And also, after the general Arab conquests from the middle 7th century through to the 8th century, around this whole peninsula, uh, well, the, the North African peninsula and the whole area of the Middle East, the vast majority of world Jewry ended up under Muslim rule. And this creates change. Firstly, you have Jewish communities which had been isolated from each other by virtue of I guess you could say geography, and are now in contact with each other. As an example, the Jewish communities in what was called Palestine had been under Christian Byzantine rule, whereas much of the rest of the Middle East was under Persian rule. And when you now put them together, you're now asking two different structures of authority to merge into one, at least in theory. And you also have Jewish communities which had previously been on the margins of the empire, which is, means being in isolation from the mainstream, are now brought into contact with this Jewish world of the yeshivas, of the academies, of rabbinic leadership. And those that had been on the fringe had developed certain ideas and ways of their own. You could almost call it Jewish heterodoxy. And now that the Islamic State not only united physically the Jews, but gave them um, recognition as a tolerated minority, so now there is encouragement, you could even say a push, for the Jewish community to have a common religious doctrine. And of course, that means that you've got dispute as to whose doctrine you are now going to follow. So, you know, Jewish authority is being redefined. And this Anun, the first, he borrows various regulations of his code from other Jewish breakaway groups and from Islam and created legislation of his own. He collates it all into a book called Sefer HaMitzvahs, which he wrote around 770 CE. Um, but what he tries to do is base all of this material, the, all the, the stuff he'd borrowed and all the stuff he'd invented and everything, on the biblical text. So he, he's got to resort to convoluted reasoning and rules in order to shoehorn it all together, especially, as we said, he doesn't believe in Tershah Balpe, any oral law. And the earliest recorded account of Anand's ideas is found in Kirkisani, who is a 10th century Karite, and he wrote an Arabic work on the mitzvahs, which is called as, uh, in, well, in Hebrew, it's called Sefer Mo'eris. And he writes, for instance, that Anand only allowed matzahs to be made from barley, because that was the earlier crop. And if they're made with wheat, they're chomets. And circumcision has to be performed with scissors. And we'll move swiftly on. After Anand's death, his successors, so obviously they differ amongst themselves, they are now subdivisions in this new sect, and they modified it, especially the more ascetic elements of uh, having to undergo many fasts and restrictions, and therefore the more stringent Ananites, the, the strict ones, they lose more and more ground during the ninth century and eventually end up in one place only, Yerushalayim. And they are living there as what you could almost define as hermits. And they are based, um, well, they base themselves on ancient uh, Jewish ideas which come across through rabbinic literature, including the Talmud, ironically, in the aftermath of the destruction of Yerushalayim, that, you know, you have to live a life of mourning. And they call themselves the Avele Tzion, the mourners of Zion. And it was Daniel al Kumisi, who actually is quoted by Kirkisani as well, that gave uh, the Karaites their main two characteristics. A, we reject Rabbinite doctrine, and B, an intense promotion of Aliyah to Yerushalayim to Eretz Yisrael. Now, 
they also forbade any labor by non-Jews on behalf of Jews. So this is where they're, so to speak, more stringent. Anything for a non-Jew cannot do anything on behalf of Jews on Shabbos, however light, however necessary. Um, and we don't know much about him. We know that he settles in Yerushalayim eventually. He's originally from northern Persia. And in his commentary on Sefer Daniel, he refers to events that took place in the second half of the ninth century. So uh, before 875 CE. And that means he must live after that. And he is the one who now gives the Karaites structure in what they're doing. So you've mentioned before a specific stringency on the... Um about how non-Jews are not supposed to do labor, what were the main halachic requirements of the Karaites? Do they have a halachic structure? Well, they did, um, and that's, I mean, the answer to that question would be rather lengthy. I will perhaps share some of the more interesting and the more important ones. So when it comes to prayer, they, like the Muslims, but unlike the Orthodox, pray by bowing down, they pray on their knees, they spread their hands during tefillah, and they base themselves on how they see it having been carried out during the times of Tanakh. And the tefillah service consists almost entirely of brochus and of readings from Torah and from Tehillim, but there are no prayers of personal petition or request so it's, you know, Tehillim, Eicha, etc. And they pray twice a day. They say the Shema without the addition of the verse, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchusay, because you don't find that in, uh, in Chumash. They wear tzitzis with Tcheles, except Tcheles just means blue. It's got no connection to all the halachic um, conversation that the Orthodox have. So which tefillah do they skip? Mariv. We will get there. It, there's an important element to it. They allow meat and milk to be eaten together, except in the specific instance of cooking a sheep in its mother's milk. And therefore, they don't have separate dishes for meat and milk. They obviously don't keep Purim or Hanukkah because they're rabbinic. And they have a very unique, different way of calculating the Jewish calendar, and they rely heavily on a personal sighting of the new moon, which meant that not only were there frequent disagreements with the Orthodox, and they could be living you know, side by side in the same town, but even within the same Karite community, you have their festivals celebrated on different dates, except that famously, the Karites always keep Shavuos on the seventh Sunday after Pesach, Mimochras HaShabos, which they translate literally. So when you say personal sighting, means the head of every household has to have seen the moon. Well, whether they um, allowed their sort of synagogue to do so, but, but it was definitely, there needed to be confirmation. And there's a whole list of rules to Kiddush HaChodesh pages of the stuff. And they always kept a Purim in Adar Rishon because they never knew if there was going to be an Adar Shani, second Adar, because there's no fixed calendar, which is, I guess, relevant to where we are at this moment in time. With regards to mikvah, so they allow the use of regular, might call nowadays tap water, Maim Shuvim. And in fact, in Anun's view, if you did not bathe in a vessel, in other words, making the water unfit for uh, a mikvah, Maim Chaim, you remain Tommy. And they would not drink rabbinite wine, nor would they have meat that was shechted by an Orthodox Jew, even if one of their own stood over while the shechita was taking place, which is interesting. And, you know, you talk about being, how stringent is your hechsha? Well, if you're a Karite, it goes all the way. That's Kadassia, right. it's a shame. Right, exactly. Whereas the rabbinites, for instance, would allow drinking a Karite's wine, it's not yain stum, as long as he made an oath, I guess, that he hadn't employed um, any non-Jews in the production of the wine. And because of their principles of faith, the Karaites were in need of the Rabbinites because they had stringencies in laws of impurity. So they used to hire Rabbinites to bury their dead. And on Shabbos, they would ask Rabbinite midwives to deliver their babies. But they still 
derided the Rabbinites and, and the communities often drifted apart. The Karaites would not attend a Rabbinite wedding. And Shabbos, the Shabbos is the big one because we mentioned earlier about non-Jews, but they themselves would do almost no work on Shabbos. And famously, they would sit in the dark on Shabbos because they interpret the verse in Vayakel of not to mean that you can't light a fire on Shabbos, but that you may not leave a fire burning during Shabbos, even if that fire was lit before Shabbos. What's fascinating is that you would generally think a stray group of Jews would look to make their lives easier and the entire reasoning why Jews would break away is because they would believe there's too many restrictions or they would be a softer form of Yiddishkeit, which is how we generally believe on some level that reform reform. happened. Right. And this is, they made their lives much more stringent. Yes, that's what I said. It's a very interesting hybrid. It's not somebody who's coming to say, I've had enough of this stuff, the rabbis. uh, I mean, they might have said the rabbis invented things, but they didn't mean that the rabbis invented things and made life too difficult. They just meant that the rabbis moved away from the original intent of the law of Moses, and we have to keep it to the letter. It's a very interesting setup. Crazy. So you mentioned the fire, and you're not allowed to light any fire at all, even sit in the darkness. What about Shabbos candles? Were you allowed to uh, yes. you allowed to light them? So what about lighting Shabbos candles? They did not. And this is where a couple of things that we've discussed come together, because a number of minhogim and halachas were developed at this time by the Orthodox, by the Goinim, in order to emphasize the differences between the Karaites and traditional Judaism. And therefore, it is now that we come across the custom to read in shul on Friday night the second chapter of the Mishnayas of Shabbos, i.e. Bamer Madlikin. What do you light with and what do you not light with Shabbos candles to highlight that it's permissible to light candles on Shabbos. It is also almost certainly now that the Takana was made to make a bracha over the mitzvah of lighting the Shabbos candles. It'd been carried out since the time of the Mishnah, It's rabbinic and early rabbinic, so to speak, but no bracha, because what the Orthodox want to do is show that not only is this allowed, but it is required. And similarly, you mentioned earlier, which tefillah did they not keep? Mariv. Mariv is termed in early halacha and in the Gemara as rishus, as a permissible prayer. But nowadays, we don't really see much of a difference except for women, but not for men, because the sages turned it into an obligatory level of prayer in order to draw a division between the Karaites and the Orthodox. Also shows the level of threat that the Karaites presented. Yes, we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, we'll see that. Now, to carry on with a rather ironic element of Karite halacha, they had a ksuba. But the ksuba is entirely rabbinic. There is no such thing in, in the Torah. So what the Karite did was write the whole thing in Hebrew rather than in Aramaic in order to show that they are different. So it's not reform. There's adherence to halacha, and Judaism is important. Uh, that's until the, the 1800s in Russia, which we'll get to. But there are marked differences with even non-religious Jews today who would be very likely to light a Hanukkah candles. And the carrot's not going to do that. What's the difference between them and the Tzedekim, the Sadducees of the second base of Mikdash? Yeah, what is the... They sound similar. So there are certain practices of both the Tzedekim and the Karaites. Neither of them blew the shofar at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah. The Karaites said Yom Trua is a day of uh, loud praises to Hashem. They both reject the mitzvah of Arba Minim, of uh, Lulav and Esrug on Sukkot, because they said that the Arba Minim are supposed to be used to build the sukkah. But the Karaites are not heirs of the Tzedekim, because many of their practices are different, although Anan tried to attempt to bridge that gap and claimed he was, uh, you know, completing the Sadducee approach, because that way the Karaites are suddenly a thousand years older. That legitimizes them more. So there are a group of people whose beliefs are considered heresy, definitely Apicorsa, some for us, 
but they in their minds they're they're completely religious they're not trying to reform anything so how did they get on with the orthodox jews at the time were they stoned at and considered apicorosim no they weren't stoned but are they considered apicorosim often uh, it's also like practice a very complex question simply because it is quite wide and therefore i'm going to have to answer this question in pieces. I'll do some this week and some over the next two weeks. One of the reasons is because during the various periods of their history and in the various different countries in which they lived, there were differences in practice. Crimea and Egypt were very different. And you also have the theological, the the philosophical debates. We will hear that one of the Karite scholars defended Judaism. So, you know, it's it's a, a mishmash of things. But on a practical level, often there was mutual contact, involvement between the Orthodox and the, Rabbi, and, and, and the Karites with regards to, let's say, taxes, taxation. And then in marriage, there are marriages that take place between Karaites and Rabbinites, and it's clearly documented, especially before the 13th century, it, to the degree that there is a model form for what they might have called um, mixed uh, marriage arrangements, which we find in a blank book of texts of Karite legal documents. After the 13th century, this is less frequent, probably because of the opposition to such marriage by the Rumbum, who said that even if the marriage is okay, because it's much easier to get married in Judaism than it is to get divorced. And there the get, the Karite bill of divorce, would have been invalid, and this would have opened the possibility of illegitimacy of of Mamzerus. So just to paint the picture, there are communities of people with Orthodox and Karites living side by side? Absolutely. Yes in many cities, in large cities, as once again, we will still come to. And at the same time, you have Karite writers who attacked the Rabbinites, and therefore they're really at loggerheads. And in many of their texts, especially prior to the First Crusade, and they are engaged in what you call, or might call, missionary propaganda. And they could speak of thousands of Jewish quote-unquote, converts who'd abandoned rabbinic Judaism in Egypt, in Palestine, in Babylonia, and therefore the reaction, unsurprisingly, <coughs> which we find quoted in Seder of Amramgon, is that uh, Natronai Barahilai, who was the head of the, uh, he was the Rishma Sifta of Surah during the 9th century, he threatened to excommunicate anybody who shortened the text of the Haggadah. And in justifying it, he says it isn't the the fact that there'll be less prayers, but it is the removal of rabbinic sources. And uh, to quote him, he says, they are heretics. They mock and slight the words of the sages. They are students of Anan who said to all those who strayed after him, abandon the words of the Mishnah and the Talmud, for I shall create for you a Talmud of my own. And we find on the Hishana Rabbah, both of 1029 and 1038, the Rabbinites proclaimed a public ban against the Karaites, referring to them as the eaters of meat and milk. And the Cherem is said to have been proclaimed on Harazesim because during those centuries, Rabbinites from all over the Mediterranean would come to Yerushalayim for Sukkot. And this ban created as you can imagine, uh, quite a fallout between the two groups, uh, even became physical at times, uh, brought in the non-Jewish authorities, and even the imprisonment of a number of Rabbinite leaders. So you've got hot and cold just in those few examples that I've shared here. So you mentioned that they were based in Iraq and in Jerusalem. Did they have any presence out of those places? Did it spread far and wide? Yes, it spread quite a bit. In Byzantium, 
which later becomes known as Constantinople, the capital of the Ottoman Empire. There you find, well, the earliest reference is a letter in the Geniza, um, Kislev 1028, uh, which concerned prisoners captured by pirates. And there were seven merchants, three rabbinites and four Karaites. And Benjamin of Tadila, who traveled extensively through Europe and the Middle East, he comes across about 2,000 rabbinites and 500 Karaites in Constantinople 150 years later. And they lived in the same district, but their settlement, so to speak, was divided by a wall. And the Karite community and their synagogue would continue to exist there into the 20th century. And on the island of Cyprus, uh, so Benjamin of Tadila found, uh, well, he found, in fact, not only Rabbinite and Karite residents, but a third group that was regarded by both the others as heretics because they celebrated Shabbos from Saturday morning to Sunday morning. But beyond that, at the beginning of the 10th century, they start moving to Palestine, they settle in Yushalayim, and from there to other places, Ramle, Damascus, and then later to Egypt, which came under a very tolerant uh, Fatimid rule at the end of the 10th century. And therefore, you have wealthy Karite communities in Cairo, in Fustat, and in Alexandria. But to go back to Yushalayim, for a moment or two. In the mid-10th century, Yerushalayim is the leading center for the Karaites. Jerusalem was a very Karite city. I imagine that, um, the majority. And they preached a life of, uh, of Bible study, of prayer and lamentation. And there is a synagogue which dates back to the 11th century uh, when the Karite community in Jerusalem was at its height pre-Crusades. And there is a Sefer Torah there, which is supposed to be more than 700 years old. And the structure of the shul was originally at street level. But over the centuries, buildings piled up around it. And it then was accessed by a staircase that descended about five meters from the courtyard. And in the first room, you removed your shoes before prayer, probably something they adopted from the uh, Muslim prayer customs. And where is this shul? In Rehov HaKroim, in Karite Street, in the Jewish quarter in, uh, in Jerusalem. And it's still in use? It still exists as a Karite synagogue, yes. I don't know what the Zmane Hatfila there are, and I don't know, uh, you know when their Sosman Kriyashma is, uh, but yes. Definitely no Mariv. Right, yes, exactly. Um, so you'd have to go down to the Kosal for that. And um, the Bartanura, we quoted the letter from the letter that he wrote to his father from Yushalayim. Um, he mentions the local Karites there. He doesn't give the number of how many there are. But by 1641, their numbers had dropped dramatically. And the entire Karite population of Yushalayim was only 27 people. In 1654, it is reported that the services at that synagogue were attended by three men and two widows. And by 1708, the uh, Rabbinites had taken over the deserted houses of the Karaites and possibly even the synagogue, although I'm not sure the synagogue itself. Why did they disappear in number so fast? So one of the hardships they encountered was a long-standing Karite custom in Jerusalem specifically, never to eat meat. And in fact, um, Shmuel Halevi, who was a Karite, composed a book called Zivchei Tzedek to justify the abolition of this custom in order to get new settlers to the holy city. And in fact, in his introduction, he calls it a decree which is too difficult for the congregation, which of course is borrowing from a Talmudic term. Now, the story is told a century later in 1741 that the Muslim mayor of the city demanded that the Jews pay a, an inordinately high tax and an urgent clandestine meeting was organized by the rabbis in the Karite synagogue. And as the shul was literally underground, it was felt that it would be the most uh, unobtrusive place to hold that meeting. And the Urachayim, Rav Chaim ben Atar, was at that stage in Yushalayim. He walked down these steps, these five meters, and he slipped and he fainted. 
And the rabbis laid him on the floor and tried to revive him. And the stone step where he had slipped was dislodged. And it revealed underneath it a volume of the Rambam's Mishnah Torah, which they had put there to show their contempt for the oral law. And when the Urachaim regained consciousness, he denounced the crime for their disrespect, and he decreed that, firstly, they would be responsible for the full tax demanded by the mayor, and he cursed them that they would never have a tenth man to make a minion. Now, certain elements of that story are undoubtedly correct, because the British consul James Finn, a hundred years later than that, in 1853 recorded, it was a judgment from heaven on the Karaites. They were never able to muster a prayer quorum. That's interesting. Although the imposing of the full tux on the Karaites would be improbable because their community was small and they were poor, so that is less likely. Um, now, we mentioned earlier other areas in Eretz Israel. There were three Jewish communities in Rumley during the 11th century, two Rabbinite ones, a Babylonian and a Jerusalemite one, and a Karite community. So there were three shuls, one for each community. And in 1039, Nassan ben Avram, describing Purim, writes that there were 400 people in the main hall of the synagogue and a greater number in the entrance hall, 200 of whom were Karaites. So that means there must have been a thousand Jewish families in Rumley, maybe 5,000 people, and 20% of them were Karaites. But also that in some ways the Karaites observed Purim. Well, they turned up to the Orthodox synagogue for it. Yes. So interestingly. For the laugh. Maybe. Well, quite literally. And perhaps on account of them being um, a small community, they tried to get converts to becoming Karaites. And so they were in constant battle with the Rabbinites for membership. So that was in Eretz Israel. A second major area of activism was Egypt. And in fact, before the Rumbum's arrival there, up to two-thirds of Cairo's community was Karite. There would be a decline during the times of the Rumbum. And in fact, there was a wholesale conversion of Egyptian Karites to uh, orthodoxy in 1313. But the Rumbum being there for 40 years with his knowledge and guidance and understanding, he diluted much of their influence, um, especially with things like mikvah. And he discusses their status in his commentary on the Mishnah, in his Mishnah Torah, in various truvas, and in one fascinating truva, he's asked about their status in halacha, in general, and in particular, focused on the particular issue of performing bris milah for Karaites on Shabbos. It's quite an interesting shiner that, because if it's allowed, it's obviously one of the biggest mitzvahs, but if not, your prince could be Mechal Shabbos. Your Mechal Shabbos, it would be biblical transgressions that you'd be carrying out, probably more than one. And the Rambam's answer is very instructive. He differentiated, on the one hand, between Karaites who, whilst following their own sort of incorrect path, still maintained respect for Rabbinite Jews and their sages, as opposed to those who mocked the words of the sages and the Talmud, and those he ruled may not be circumcised on Shabbos, nor was there a mitzvah to bury their dead. So it's very much related to their beliefs rather than their practices, which is in line with the 13 principles of faith that we mentioned when we spoke about the Rambam. And it's not only in Egypt alone that he had a strong influence, but even in Bovel, even in North Africa, quite a number of them, some, it's true, converted to Islam, but mostly came back to rabbinic Judaism. And eventually, although we don't have a lot of information about the community, we know that in the 17th, 18th centuries, the community was small, living on one street, and most members were poor. Although the 1838 Anglo-Ottoman Trade Convention provided, which is, of course, well known, provided an opening for certain Karaites and Rabbinites to work as money changers, and therefore some families, Karait families, began to amass wealth, and it grew from approximately 200 in 1821 to 2,000 50 years later. And in 1937, there were over 5,000 Karaites in Egypt. 
And do we have any numbers of today? Because there's not many Jews left there at all. We will get there. Not Well, in Egypt, not. But there are still characters in the world. Yes, in America, in Eretz Israel. Part three, no doubt. In part three. We'll touch on it in part two there. And I wanted to end today with an unusual Karite story from the 11th century, which starts in Toledo, which at the time was the capital of an Islamic uh, area, region. And a number of Jews from there migrated to join the Karite community in Yerushalayim, although they eventually abandoned it. And there whole story is contained in a letter written in 1057, preserved in the Cairo Geniza. Now, in the 10th century or 11th century, we are told by one of the sages in Spain that there has never been any heresy amongst uh, Iberian Jewry, i.e. the Karaites, except in the number of villages bordering the land of Edom, in other words, of the Christian parts of Spain. But whereas that might be true in Spain, in the East, uh, the Rabbinites and the Karaites often coexisted more peacefully, and they had partnerships in business, and we know that from the Cairo Geniza. and they contributed jointly to communal causes, and they shared the burdens of Jewish organizational life, and they even, the Karaites even pursued cases in rabbinic courts. And as we mentioned earlier, they occasionally married one another, despite their religious differences, or sometimes because of those differences, which brought social advantages to the husband or wife. And in fact, they would now have to devise marriage contracts, you know, lengthy ksubas, which protected each spouse's religious customs, you know, when you would celebrate Yomim Tovim. I've seen a mixed ksuba where you have a rabbinite man marrying a Karite woman, that he should not expect any hot food on Shabbos because she won't use any type of fire on that day, even for pre-cooked food. A very different to our difference in Minhogim today, which of course are all go under one umbrella of being orthodox. Yes. Here you had two people who claimed to be orthodox. Who, or who claimed to be fully religious. Maybe yeah. that's the way to put it. Yes. So this was specifically Karite women and Rabbinite men, or was yes. it the other way around as well? No, most of the mixed marriages were between Karite brides and, and Rabbinite uh, Hassanim, rarely the opposite. Why was that the case? Um, for social reasons, the Karites at certain stages tended to be wealthier and therefore they're marrying into power. In fact, there is a famous ksuba of um, David ben Daniel, who was a high-powered individual, a rabbinite. He marries the daughter of a rich and influential Karite in Fustat, and it's, so to speak, a marriage in the public interest because he needed Karite support for his political career. Now, it's unusual to find abundant detail that we do in this letter of 1057, written by a Rabbinite immigrant from Toledo to Jerusalem to his sister, who's still in Toledo. Now, this sister, Baluta, hadn't received a letter from her brother in a while, so he is very unstinting with details, and he, he gives several years' worth of news. And he talks about the fact that a new group of Jewish immigrants from Toledo arrived in Palestine and included in them was one couple who had made their way there after quite some ordeals because they'd been taken captive and then they'd been ransomed. And um, this couple, the, the, the guy's name was Ibrahim Ibn Fadanj, if I'm doing justice to the Arabic pronunciation. Now, he arrives in Ramle, he's ransomed there. He becomes the gossip amongst the other immigrants from Toledo because he and his wife had originally been Rabbinites. And at some stage before their arrival in Palestine, they switched over to becoming Karaites. In fact, it's probable that the reason they left Spain to come to Yerushalayim is because they were on the point of becoming Karaites. And this, Ibn Fadanj and his wife, having become Karaites, that wasn't the problem itself. The problem was that his brother was married to her sister. And whereas in Halacha, that's fine, Karite law outlawed it. 
And, you know, the women in Rumley are starting now to publicise these families' intimate details, and they find themselves in the uncomfortable position. Uh, they wanted to live here in, in Israel, but they're finding the Jews a little bit more of a zealous type of Karite than they had hoped for. And this letter writer, this uh, Shimon al Tulali. Tully wastes no time in protecting them. He uh, silences the, uh, you know, the kibitzers and the and the the, the um, scandal mongers, even though he's a rabbinite, and he ridicules the Karite beliefs and especially their strict laws of marriages. Uh, but he believes it's wrong to be doing this. And eventually, this Ibn Fadanj and his wife they move to Yerushalayim with their four children and they join the Karite community there. All is well for two years. Two years later, the Karai elders found out that this guy's brother is married to her sister and made them divorce. And the letter writer, you know, leaps to their protection again. He is negotiating on behalf of the couple. And they, the couple, then put an end to their own predicament by rejoining the Rabbinite community, um, in which case their marriage is permissible. And obviously, their desire to preserve their marriage trumped the religious ideology that had brought them to Jerusalem in the first place. So you have these um, quite unusual accounts of uh, Jews who uh, had chosen to change and had then elected to change back. Way too stringent for them. Rabbi Hirsch, thank you very much. That was a great start to a new series. Um, please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss another episode and keep sending your questions to podcast at jd.org.uk. Remember to email the email address in the description below for the details of the trip. And we'll see you next week for part two, although it might be a little late. Aren't you flying next week? Flying this week, I'm to to Toronto, so it'll be a day or two late next week, yes. Have a good night.